I am a strong black woman. I love who I am. I birthed from a black woman and she was birthed from a black woman. So I can't get away from being black. Mm -hmm. And I understand the black experience. And I know that other people of color who have similar experiences when we need some help, you mm -hmm. know, affirmative mm -hmm. action isn't a handout. It's years and years of things that have been taken away from us. And we just trying to have restoration. Ladies and gentlemen, you're rocking with a goat. Ken Dow giving you motivation for growth. Two toes down, he keep it realer than most. He do it for the culture, that's always the goal. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Strategic Moves. I'm your host, Ken Dow. And today, it's going to be an easy day for me because I had a friend of mine to come by and visit today. She's somebody that been in my life for quite a while. I think, hell, she was around before we had kids. So I've been measuring my relationship with some of these people by how old my kids are. So you was around before Kennedy. Kennedy's 21 years old, so that means you've been around at least 21 years. At a minimum. Wow. Yeah, see that? Yeah. Me and you done battled through some crazy situations and had a whole lot of various different things to go through. And now she is the county councilwoman, District 9, Cleveland, Cuyahoga County. <laughs> Her name is Meredith Turner. Oh, what's up, brother? How you doing today, councilwoman? I'm good because this is work, but it's not work. Because oh. anytime I get to sit and talk with family, it's a blessing. Oh, you know? always, always. The next minute, it's not promised. So thank you for the invitation, and I'm happy to be here. Let's let's talk. Let's do this. So, Meredith Turner, tell us, who are you? Where you come from, man? You grew up in Cleveland. Give us your backstory. Wow, you know, that's crazy because I knew that I would one day have to, you know, tell this story. And when I get to talking about myself, sometimes it's surreal. Let's break the mystery. Who is Meredith Turner? Well, I'm your sister. I'm your friend. I'm your niece. I'm your daughter. I'm just like anybody else. My family originated in the central area. Oh. I'm straight up from the project. So what projects? Carver Park. Carver Park. Yeah. So you went to school there? You grew up a baby there? I was, so I was a baby there. So I was born on Ashbury. Oh, that's in so, Glenville. Right. Yeah. That, and it's funny because I was just like up the street from the late congresswoman's house. Everything comes full circle. So mm -hmm. that's where I was born. And my family moved down to the projects. My grandparents lived at Carver Park. So my mm -hmm. mother's like the second of eight. Mm. And then she moved up the street on community college. Okay. So I lived in both of those projects. My aunt lived around the corner on court, mm. on, off Unwin there. Yeah, right. You know, I got this little scar up under my chin. I remember this boy had some cans stacked up and the top one was cut off and he was hitting the cans with the stick and cut me <laughs> across the bottom of my lip. You know, memories. Right? So you got that from down there. Absolutely. I got that from down the way. So I often still find myself attracted to that community because that's where I'm from. So it was you, your mom, your father? Um... I am the third child. So my eldest sister, Lisa, she passed away in 2016. Mm. My brother's two years under her, Ronald. We mm -hmm. call him Charlie. He's an army vet. Okay. I'm the middle child. I was born in 73 and I got a little brother, PJ oh, or okay. Percy. And okay. he was born in 80. So mm -hmm. my mom, she started her career with CMHA, Arcelor Middle, 40 years. In the steel mill. 40 years in the steel mill. Wow. Hard, hard work. So mm -hmm. that's all I know as a person. My mother never complained. She got up every day, 3 to 11, 11 to 7, 7 to 3. Mm -hmm. You know, that was an arduous life. My eldest sister, Lisa, she was in charge of the household. Right. So we all had chores. But we were fortunate that lifestyle, you mm -hmm. know, being in a union. Right. Um, right. My mother moved right. the family. Before we got the shaker, though, so after the projects, we moved on 93rd and Manor. <laughs> I remember my brother, Charlie, got stabbed. Really? <laughs> in the shoulder by this guy named Frankie. <laughs> They was playing cards. I don't know. I just remember that violent experience, right? <laughs> but I guess my mother was like, right, we got to move, right? Right, right. <laughs> we got to move. And that took us on 105 and Lee. Hmm. So those were some good years, I, you know. So nothing tragic happened on Lee. You, well, nobody lost no limbs the or family, got stabbed. But I, you know, East Cleveland was on a decline. And Lee back in those days, Lee Road Lee was hot. 
it, yeah. it got it, it got it, real it hot. It was real hot on Leah. It yeah. got real hot. And so my mother was like, it's time to go. And we moved to Shaker. And in 1985, grandfather murdered my grandmother. Oh, Jesus Christ. Straight up. And when was this? 85. I know it was like around Thanksgiving, before really? Thanksgiving. My grandmother went missing. And so I was, what, 12, 13. So I didn't really mm -hmm. know what was happening, but just it was a lot of motion. And people your mother's father? Your father, father's father? My mother's mother and father. I know that had to devastate your mom. That was devastating. My grandfather sharecropped from Montgomery, Alabama. He migrated to the central area. My grandmother was from Georgia. She migrated from Georgia for work. They mm -hmm. both came up north and they met each other and settled in the central area. It really wasn't too many places you could go, you know, black folks in the 50s that, you know, segregated. So mm -hmm. they settled in that area, had eight children. My grandfather really was, he was a junk man. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of job he ever had. Right. And maybe some folks can relate to that also. But my grandmother was a domestic. She cleaned houses until she couldn't anymore. So, yeah, that, that happened and... My mother, she was like, we out, you know, so that was pretty traumatic for us. Mm. And Shaker really opened up the world for me. So how old was you when you moved to Shaker um, Heights? 12. 12. So 12. You, you was ready to get it right into middle school, I would imagine. Right. I was attending the Cleveland School of Science before. So I, I never that. I was I like, right, the little ball. The little the, ball, yeah. The, uh, uh, planetarium yeah. used to sit right. out there. Mm -hmm. They demolished that some years back. So I was already kind of on a different pathway okay. educationally, you know, going to the magnet school. But Shaker just took it to a whole other level for me. And I didn't even understand because mm. I wanted to go back to the neighborhood, right? Because right? Right. this is where all my friends were. Exactly. And it was hot. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, right. we used to walk up and down 105. And, you know, it just... I wasn't going nowhere good. For me. Right. <laughs> what was the biggest thing that you noticed from the hood making that transition that you was like, you know, I heard about this, but I didn't really think they did this, but they really do this. You know what? I, I really didn't have any inclination that life was like that other than by television. So the environment was very appealing to me. It was mm -hmm. peaceful and serene. You know, we had a lot of trees and grass mm -hmm. and we had a, a home. Prior to that, we had lived in apartment buildings or in a duplex and rented. So having our own home was different and having neighbors that mm -hmm. didn't look like me. It was really different. Yeah, that was mind-blowing. One of my transitions when we moved to Cleveland Heights, that was different from the hood to me. I didn't notice how often everybody walked their dogs in the hood. A few people walked their dogs. In the hood. They yeah. had pets. People had pets. I mean, right. they had dogs, but when, they didn't walk them. They kept them either in their backyard right. or they King. kept them, yeah. right? Or the other ones, they were on chains and you didn't even want to come close. But watching that happen and just say, wow, people actually really walked their dogs. And then the other thing for me was that in the neighborhood down the way, people hang out in the front of the house, like sit on the porch and that kind of thing. And in the suburbs, everybody hang out yeah, in the, the back. back. Cause you would ride down the street and it looked like nobody's right. home or nobody's there. It'd be a nice warm day. It's like, where everybody at? You know, you go down the hood, you ride down any street down there. It's like, whoa, you know, you pull right into the party. Yeah, right? Back, and, and, right. And that was the biggest difference for us when we moved out there. And it wasn't a bad one. It was just that, you know, wow, right. everybody walks their dog around here. And I mean, they walk and their dogs are, touching each other they're talking mm -hmm. to dogs and dog parks and I stuff it's like you know that was a real big transition I, I can definitely relate you know my little brother had a lot of video game i would say a big difference also we didn't have a lot to do before we was outside okay. we would play mm -hmm. kickball in the street right we exactly everybody on the street exactly. you know, we had these right. street games so that, that changed a little that bit changed a lot. you know um, they don't do that in the summer they don't do that in the like you're right we played in the street Actually, you play. Wait, because we had parks. <laughs> and, right. Well, well, you know, that was the other thing. You had parks and we people took you to the park. And in the neighborhood, you actually literally, some of the best games we played were right in, in the middle of the street. Right, right in the middle of the street. So let's go back. All right, you Shaker Heights, 12 years old. So yeah. you get into Shaker. How was your education? You remember right there. Was you able to keep up? Was it different for you? you have any challenges in school? I was always smart and I understood, but my education, it wasn't up to par. Mm. So Cleveland was different. The mm -hmm. standard was different. I always had a, a B average. I was able to keep up, but in hindsight, I wish I would have been able to take honors classes, um, advanced courses, but I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't there because I didn't get that foundation from Cleveland. My writing, my math, uh, comprehension and all those types of things only got better when I got to college. Okay. 
because my shaker years was spent just kind of catching me up. You know, okay. I didn't really start to flourish until college and afterwards. Shaker was like high school musical and Harry <laughs> Potter. <laughs> All right. It was magical and mm -hmm. it was just, you know, I played sports okay. and I yeah, you know what? That's right. You did play sports in school. Yeah. yeah, I played basketball, mm -hmm. volleyball, I threw the shot put in the discus. You know, the stuff <laughs> I, you know, never had been exposed to. Right? right. I took foreign languages, I took Spanish, I took Russian, mm -hmm. I took German. I was just exposed to many different things. Mm -hmm. And like I said, from where we came from, moving to a middle class situation. We were still working poor at, at that mm -hmm. time. So when it came time for me to go to college and I'm like bringing home FAFSAs and college applications and my mother's like, <laughs> what is this? Right. right, right. I, anyway, I just always knew that I wanted to go to college. I mean, it wasn't like you're going to college or you're going to be an engineer. We was just still trying to live. Trying but to figure it out. Because of sports, mm -hmm. I was afforded another opportunity. Mm -hmm. Tri-C wanted to give me a scholarship, right? Really? We like, well, Tri-C got scholarships. Well, you know what? And, and that's funny because they do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they do. They right. Yeah. So I wouldn't discount that education at all. I got it, Tri-C. I was able to go. And you did. You went to Tri-C for how many years? You did your under did two, get, two years. Two years. So you mm -hmm. kind of went there and knocked out a lot of your prereqs, I, I imagine, did. and stuff like that to get I yourself did. ready. And that's why I say I started to flourish once I actually got to that level because Shaker was an amazing experience for me. It wasn't that I couldn't keep up. I just had not been exposed to certain things. And because of athletics, I learned a lot of team building. I wasn't the best player on the team, mm -hmm. but I got better, Right. you know, right. and I'm still getting better, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. but I got better incrementally, mm -hmm. developed the shot, understood the game, and that allowed me the opportunity to get the scholarship. So mm -hmm. I left Tri-C on another scholarship, Chicago State University, so Cougars, <laughs> South Side of Chicago, mm. 9501 South King Drive. Now, Chicago and Cleveland. Two different spots. Oh, I my God. That. that was like night and day. That was some of the best and worst times of my life. <laughs> that was the first time I got robbed. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, my roommate was from the west side of Chicago. Oh, okay. And she played on a team with mm -hmm. me, and she, we was going to visit where she lived and everything. And we were standing on the corner waiting for the bus to come. Mm. And I had on this thin old little <laughs> gold chain, something similar to this size I got over right. here. And she had on this thick old herringbone chain, but mm -hmm. she was much shorter than me. So she was on the inside of me. And some guy came from around the corner, snatched my chain, dug his nails all in my neck, mm. totally missed her. But he was timing it with the bus. Wow. So I'm like, yeah, they ain't, this ain't the first time they done did this. Wow. Snatched his thing and jumped on the did. bus and took right. off. So wow. I'm devastated. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm calling my mother. I'm ready to come home. Mm -hmm. Be like, yes, you know, we can tell you what she said, but. Mm -hmm. Keep your ass off the south side. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like you're stronger than that. Yeah, right? you do it over um, there anyway. But that, that, yeah, that was crazy. And so Craig Hodges, okay. who played for the Bulls. Right, exactly. He was the men's head basketball coach at our college. Really? And so, yeah, Craig is still a good friend of mine. Hmm. So I had some great opportunities. Uh, he took us to that last game that Jordan played before he retired. Or, okay. See, I'm getting old. I don't know mm -hmm. if it was the first game when he came back after the time. I don't know. <laughs> right. but I got to see Jordan play. One of those retirements. Because of him. Yeah, it was, it mm -hmm. was amazing. So I ended up, again, play basketball and volleyball for state. It was terrible. <laughs> but I got an education. Bachelor's of Psychology. Had a double major, occupational therapy, and Oh my goodness. I remember taking this anatomy of physiology class, Ken, mm. and we had a cadaver lab. Oh, a real like, cadaver lab. I had lab. to take my hats off to doctors and anybody to go inside a body mm. minus the mortician. Well, them too. Well, they just destructing it. it, it it's still, it's still it, the they same thing. It yeah. is the same still thing. The but same. The, yeah. you know, learning the body from the bone to the nerves <clears throat> and the muscles, it was fascinating. I really enjoyed that. I was scheduled to graduate with my psychology degree. So mm. I was like, forget occupational therapy, I'm out. And I stayed in Chicago for a little while, worked at a school. And I remember like coming home on a break and seeing my mom and I'm like, damn, she getting older. Right. I'm getting older. Right. 
you know, mm -hmm. like something's happening here. You know, mm -hmm. somewhere I left my childhood. Seemed like you lost some time. And I started to yeah. grow up. All right. And, and in that growing up, realized that time moves on and, and all things come to an end or they evolve. So that kind of scared me. And I was like, I want to go home. I want to be with my mom. Mm -hmm. So nevertheless, I worked in Chicago for a while at a school, at a behavioral school. And I still have relationships with some of those kids today because it's nothing like relating to your own when they have problems. But I came home and came back to Shaker. And my principal, when I was in high school, was still at Shaker, Ajak Rumbaugh. He was the coolest white principal that you could ever ask for when Run DMC was hot. Yeah. I mean, we had a pep rally and he came out there with some Adidas on oh, with okay. no shoe, st no okay. shoe strings. Okay. He came out to the song. It was pretty dope. But he was still there. I had a degree, but I didn't know what in the hell I was going to do because, you know, no one ever said, oh, Meredith, you're beautiful. You're going to be a model. Right. Or you're so smart and analytical. You're going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Whatever. I didn't have a clue what I was going to do really? upon graduation. Mm -hmm. I just knew I had a home to come to. Right. And so with that degree, I became like a substitute teacher. Okay. How Shaker. long did you do that? So that was 98. And that's crazy because my little brother was just graduating high school. And that was one of the reasons why Tri-C was a good choice for me because I was his babysitter. Really? Right. So I was dragging him all around college campus at a very young age. So mm -hmm. I like to think that all of his success is attributed to me. No. <laughs> I need your master's falling. You have a master's. What's your master's in? Education. Well, Bill Trost, who was an assistant principal at Shaker, was a part of this group. It was called the Greater Cleveland Teachers Consortium. Again, I had a degree. I didn't know what I was going to do. I kind of ended up back in the educational space. So I said, why not become a teacher? So mm -hmm. I went. They gave me, I think it was $1,000, and I mm -hmm. started taking courses to become a teacher. Okay. So ultimately, I worked in Shaker in the special education space. I worked in the multi-handicap unit at Shaker mm -hmm. Middle School, coached seventh grade basketball won a championship oh you won a championship yeah we won a seventh grade championship at shaker oh i left hmm. shaker i went to cleveland got my master's in curriculum instruction I was teaching sixth seventh and eighth grade at joseph gallagher middle school so hmm. I, I would say around 98 was when i met stephanie tubbs jones i mean it was like hmm. right when i came home from college Let's talk about that. When did you meet her and how did you meet the late congresswoman? Yeah, so I had a girlfriend that I went to Shaker with, Sean McIntyre. I'm naming names. My mom had always voted Democrat, so I voted Democrat. She okay. was in the union, so those things were important to me, but I wasn't political at the time. He was involved with some program called Next Leadership Generation. Mayor Michael White mm -hmm. had invited us to come down to City Hall for something, and I'm hanging out with her. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, um, Cordell Stokes is running for council, and there's a parade on Kinsman. I want you to come with me and meet Michael Taylor, who works for Stephanie Tubbs Jones. And okay. so I'm like, yeah, whatever. And Jim Chone was, I think, working with Cordell or okay. something. And he was in a parade, and I worked for Jim at his basketball camps. So Cordell was running for council? Cordell ran for council. Oh, against that. He did. Right. No, we, we, I was in that. See? Yeah. So I rolled down Kinsman with Jim Chones mm -hmm. and... When we got to Luke Easter Park, mm. Vashi introduced me to Stephanie Tubbs Jones. Mm. So that was 98 and she smiled at me and I mm. was like, oh my God, I'm in love. Who is this lady? Mm -hmm. She was just so effervescent, you know, very energetic, very generous, invited me to come to the office. And so her staff pretty much took me in, Saulette Reed, mm -hmm. Betty Pinkney, <laughs> Patrice Willoughby. Patrice mm -hmm. was on DC, Nicole Williamson. Yeah, I remember Nicole. They just all kind of took me in. They would let me go with them to events in the community. They would let me hang out with the congresswoman from time to time. They invited me to be a volunteer for the 11th Congressional District Caucus, I guess, at the time. And okay. so I just started volunteering with her for different stuff besides the parade. And initially it was like, yeah, what's that girl's name? Right. <laughs> you know, to... Right. You know, yeah, call uh, Mur Mur yeah, Meredith, <laughs> you know, <laughs> invite her to the meeting mm -hmm. to, you know, hey, babe, I got this roast cooking. Come get you something to eat. So it was mm -hmm. just a relationship that evolved. I got to spend the last 10 years of her life mm -hmm. with her. That's cool. And uh, it, it was amazing. In 2006, she introduced me to Sherrod Brown. Gerald Avert had passed. Right. His services was at the music hall, mm -hmm. and her staff had some role in operations right. or mm -hmm. whatever. And I'm down there with Beverly Charles, and we in the room, and 
she comes in with the congresswoman from Detroit, Carolyn Kilpatrick Cheeks. Mm. And she said, yeah, and she's introducing every, you know how the congresswoman was. She introduced everybody because you felt like she was your best friend. You know, everybody felt like that. But she said, yeah, this is Meredith. And the congresswoman said, Meredith? She said, well, baby, I think you got a job. And that's how I learned that I was possibly going to be going to work for Sherrod Brown, who had just run for U.S. Senate because mm -hmm. via the congresswoman, I got connected with his campaign and worked his campaign. We, we won, and he invited me to join his staff January of 2007. So you was working for Sherrod Brown. And yes. I, I know right after you met the congresswoman, that's when we had an opportunity to meet, and you worked with us, and part of our group, we all put that together and kind of worked through that. And then you worked on several other campaigns because we was working on plenty of campaigns and initiatives throughout that. So how long was you over there with Sherry? Oh, a decade. <laughs> yeah. It right. was that it went quick. Yeah, 2006, 2016. Williamson, right. Leah Jones mm -hmm. calling out the African American staff. Mm -hmm. A few African American staff. Definitely at least one of us in each of his offices mm -hmm. in Cincinnati in Columbus. We had a very diverse staff. I like Sherrod Brown what as a you, person. What were you doing over there for Sherrod? So I was a caseworker. So I handled Department of Homeland Security. Underneath that, all the immigration issues, all the enforcement issues related to mm -hmm. immigration, mm -hmm. deportations. I pretty much helped develop the foundation of how we would handle immigration cases, especially when people were being deported, people requesting visas for family members abroad, students want to travel abroad, foreign students want to come into the country to do exchanges, border patrol. So all the stuff under Homeland Security as well as Department of State. So that was a full time job, but I also represented him in Northeast Ohio as a staffer. You travel with the Senator, you help him get prepared for meetings. You take meetings on his behalf because obviously again, he's got Cincinnati, Lorraine, Cleveland mm -hmm. and DC offices. And he's seeing constituents in all of those places. So he can't be everywhere at the same time. So we were deputized as his representative. So I took a lot of meetings, especially here. Always wanted to make sure that the African-American community was represented and that we had access. Mm -hmm. Stephanie's whole plan, the late Congresswoman's whole plan was to make sure that her constituency was represented and had a voice with the incoming senator. I was to ask you, what was one of the big takeaways you can say working for Sherrod Brown? You know, I never knew that Sherrod Brown was well off. <laughs> mm. He is for the working people. One of the things that I would take away most from my experience with him, and, and we still have a relationship, but we had a staff retreat in D.C. once. Uh, he brought everybody to D.C. and he took us on a tour of the Senate. And so he's pointing out these desks and Senator Obama sat there and Senator Kennedy, John and Ted. And so they had this tradition in the Senate where they would carve their names in these desks. So he was pointing out high profile senators. And so he showed us the desk of Jefferson Davis. Mm. And I'm like, oh, Confederate president, you know, like this was a real person, mm. Jefferson Davis, Hillary Clinton's desk, you know, but what he did was he pointed to the ceiling and he told us to look up and all around the Senate, there are these busts of white me and he was like it's a shame that there's not one african-american or one woman represented in this chamber mm -hmm. and uh, it just kind of speaks to the type of person that he is mm -hmm. uh, for real when senator obama was inaugurated we had a staff raffle and everybody from all over ohio was calling us trying to get tickets to go to the inauguration i mean it was the hottest ticket in town right mm -hmm. so we had this staff raffle and i was like yeah i'll never win I'm not going to get a ticket to mm -hmm. see the first black president be inaugurated. And so I know Sherrod rigged that raffle. <laughs> <laughs> African-American staff mm -hmm. had an opportunity to go. I went and okay. that was just like one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I, I was with Harriet Applegate, formerly of the AFL-CIO, and I think Andrea Mitchell. We made that journey together. It was cold. As oh, yeah. It oh, my God. It was so that cold day. that yeah. day. And we got stuck in the tunnel. It wasn't moving, like, for hours. Mm -hmm. Like, wait a minute. I got a Senate badge. Hold yeah. up. I'm somebody, right? right? Exactly. And we got to navigating through that crowd. And we ultimately made it up to where we were supposed to be. So that was an amazing experience. It was so many people out there. But Sherrod consistently 
shows me that he gets it. He tries to make sure that there are opportunities for people. And I enjoyed the decade that I worked for him. People still think I work for Cher. Mm -hmm. I get phone calls. I get emails, people mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to get stuff done. But everybody on staff takes my call. Mm -hmm. And then I guess from there, I know you had took some time off for a little while to take care of some personal stuff and get things together. And then you got back out there again. And your mom, she passed, not was last year? Yes, yeah, it was last year. A year ago. You know, I know that was a rough time for you. I know how tight you guys were. And it's funny because, you know, I worked with you for a minute. We helped get Frank Jackson reelected to mm -hmm. a, what, mm -hmm. a fourth term. Uh, yeah. And so my youngest brother worked at the Board of Elections. And mm -hmm. again, I'm a teacher by training. So he was saying how they were looking for trainers and you know, we're basically teaching people how to run elections. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that was always so funny to me. It's like election day, all those people are volunteers. No matter what board of elections you go to, no matter what county wow. within a state, everybody on election day mm -hmm. are volunteers. And so I signed up for that and I started training. And that was amazing because I got to see how elections are facilitated. And there was an opportunity for me to take a full-time position there. So mm -hmm. I coordinated voting for people in nursing homes, people mm -hmm. in jails. Okay people who had sight impairments and mm -hmm. other disabilities for four years. So when I left there, I was a supervisor in the ballot and tabulation department. So we were responsible for everything related to the ballot, its creation, making sure all the candidates' names was on there spelled correctly, vote by mail applications, accepting them, rejecting them, tabulating and counting up the ballots and getting that official report to the Secretary of State's office. And so I've been active in the community for half my life. I'll be 49 next month. So I never did it for anything. I believed in democracy. I believed in democratic principles and values, solidarity forever. My mother's in the union. So using a basketball analogy, I just felt like a lot of assists. Mm -hmm. Helping people get set up. You're in position. Here go the ball, King. Right. Giving you a good pass. Mm -hmm. you know, so you can take that shot and mm -hmm. make it. When Chantel Brown, our chairwoman, and my former county councilwoman stepped up, moved on to Congress, that created a vacancy for the county council seat. So I kind of found myself underneath the basket, getting smacked in the face by the ball, mm -hmm. like, dog, are you going to pass this out? Or take Or you going to dump this? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> right? All right. Yeah, so I, I took the shot, Ken, and fortunately I was successful. November 10th, the Cuyahoga County Democratic Central Committee mm -hmm. for District 9 overwhelmingly elected me to replace our current congressman. Oh, that's a very exciting Brown. time for us. I was definitely pulling for you on that one. I knew as soon as the vacancy was there, I said, that's Meredith. Now, everybody who was Ron Slot, y'all know Meredith. That's her seat. We, Thank you know, you. And it was to the point that I said that if you decided that you wanted to run for it, for as much as you done for others, I think people yeah. should look out for you. So I'm glad that you are now our new council person over there in District 9. So let's talk about county council. Some of the nuances that you are getting used to. Tell me what it was like getting sworn in and getting down there. Wow. So I am so overwhelmed. So happy, so joyful about this opportunity. I'm sad because my mom isn't here with me, but mm -hmm. she prepared me for times such as this. Mm -hmm. So I know she's with me in spirit. There's no failure here. Mm -hmm. I have no choice but to be successful given where I've come from. But I said if I got elected that I would take some time to really understand county government before you go in there and start trying to make changes. And I know a lot of changes need to be made. I'm the public, like you, right. who was given a little position, uh -huh. right? So I've been on the other side and I haven't relinquished that. And I don't think I ever will. So I've been reading the newspaper and seeing all the things that have gone wrong in the county. So I thought the best thing for me to do was to approach this like a university. I've been meeting with all the director heads of the different departments, getting briefed on just the functionality of those agencies or departments, what they're responsible for, and what our oversight role is on council. I've met with Executive Butish mm -hmm. to understand his role better mm -hmm. and how we work together from the executive branch with the mm -hmm. legislative branch. I've been working with constituents to get problems solved. I mean, that's the job. But what I've learned more than anything is that county council controls the purse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing gets done in the county without going through county council. So I've been attending the board of control meeting, mm -hmm. which I'm not a member. Okay. We do have two members from council who sit on the board of control. And basically what 
they're responsible for is any frat, uh, procurement opportunity under a million dollars. And anything above a million dollars goes through council for approval. So it's smaller contracts with right. you know, other vendors and things like that. So I'm learning this from the ground up so I can be best effective. I finally, I got my committee assignments. Mm-hmm. What committees are on? So chairman, uh, Mr. President Jones, I ain't playing. Okay. I'm like, okay, I'm just about to get in here and get a committee or two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I got four. Right. So I have finance and budgeting, oh, which is a big one. Big ones, yeah. Right? And then I have public works, procurement and contracting, which is another big one. That's all the roads, the bridges. Mm-hmm. I mean... It's a lot of money coming through both of those committees. So I can really understand the dollars, where they're coming from, which mm-hmm. fund. It's a lot, but it's fun really learning this. Health and human services and aging. Now, if I had to describe the county, it's human services. That's what it is. Well, Mary, if you're down here for us, and when I keep saying that is that the county and this county executive race is going to heat up and they're going to talk about building out the lakefront and all the other stuff but the county is all about human services man and as long as we got kids that have to sleep in that jane etna hunter building because we can't fix that situation the jails is in the situation it's in If we're not taking care of the seniors in this community, our kids in daycare, the welfare department down there that does what it does, and all these other programs that the county does, that's the main function of the county and what it's supposed to do. Yes, I believe that it should assist the cities in its development issues, endeavors, any way that we can to spur development up because all of it is resources that comes back to the county. I get that. But the main function is to support and take care of the people. And that's why I tell you all the time that you're there for us. Now, I'm not saying none of the other guys down there are not for that, Mm -hmm. but I know firsthand from dealing with you, you understand it a little bit different because of the way you got it and the way you got in there. Not to say anybody else there is anything different or anything wrong or they get it, but you get it in a way that the little people need to make sure of that. So I expect you to work out for us. I expect you to look out for the small business, man. We expect you to go down there and look out and fight always for seniors and fighting always for the small people. So with that, some of the plans you think you would like to do as county council. Honestly, Ken, what I'm also learning is that this legislative body is not like Congress or even legislators at the state house. A lot of what we do does have to do with the money in the county. And we don't have pet projects or draft legislation that's kind of issue based. I think, you know, as I'm learning, I- I'm going to be doing more to try to find extra dollars for a particular agency to deal with a certain issue. For example, I've been working with state rep Janine Boyd and Sarah Carruthers from the very beginning to try mm-hmm. to get Aisha's law passed. So that's mm-hmm. a domestic violence mm-hmm. is something very close to my heart, given, you know, what I expressed earlier about my grandmother. I'm a survivor myself of mm-hmm. domestic violence and that's not a story that is mm-hmm. known but when Lance Mason murdered my high school classmate and mm-hmm. my Delta sister mm-hmm. I felt it was incumbent upon me to tell my story so he can do things like support I can write the state house because it's in the Senate Judiciary Committee right now mm-hmm. So I can use my office to try to show that we support, hey, we have committed X amount of dollars to this issue here in Cuyahoga County. You Mm -hmm. know, what can we do to move this forward? Mm -hmm. You know, I can try to find other dollars for the agencies that deal with that issue at the county level. Mm -hmm. So I may not necessarily be passing a piece of legislation because, I mean, I can say all day that, you know, we support Domestic Violence Awareness Month or whatever, but where are the dollars going to be able to help a family that has been displaced Mm -hmm. or things like that. But I know that the county had declared racism. And Uh so I'm looking at that in real time, like, okay, you can create a committee and you can put a bunch of fancy people on that committee, but what are they actually doing? And I don't know yet Mm because I haven't met with that body yet, but I plan to. One of the things I would like to see, and I've talked to my colleagues, I've talked to council president, I've talked to the executive about every employee has to do a mandatory cyber training. And that's important because we want to keep information secure. We have to do a ethics training, Mm -hmm. right? Because we need to know what we Mm -hmm. can accept, what we can't accept, all those kind of things. But what about a DNI training? Is there a diversity and inclusion training for you, the executive? Okay. 
right? Your whole administration, all of your directors, all of the managers and supervisors in mm -hmm. every county and department in mm -hmm. the county, because typically when we see these abuses, they are by our superiors, Okay. right? And this, I don't think has anything to do with critical race theory. You okay. know what I mean? Right, it, right. It's just truth is truth, truth fact is, truth is, is fact. fact. And people need to understand who works for them and how to best deal with people. So that's something that we're exploring. I am a strong black woman. I love who I am. I was birthed from a black woman and she was birthed from a black woman. So I can't get away from being black. Mm -hmm. And I understand the black experience. And I know that other people of color who have similar experiences, when we need some help, you mm -hmm. know, affirmative mm -hmm. action isn't a handout. It's years and years of things that have been taken away from us. And we just trying to have restoration. So I can look at policies and regulations as a way of trying to restore some things. So before I get too deep into like my agenda and I'm still trying to learn everything that I can about the county, I met with Health and Human Services Director Dave Merriman last Friday. I know there've been a lot of problems coming out of that agency. You know, I was talking to Bill Mason at one point and he had told me that the county had almost 500 positions open. Because of COVID, you got a lot of your employees that are working at home and that kind of thing. Are you guys thinking about doing anything about trying to make these work areas safer? Or are you thinking more about hybrid schedules with some of your employees and that kind of thing? Or what are you guys so, with that? So my meeting with Director Merriman, we did a tour. He broke down the structure. And I, I'm definitely trying to relate to the job that has to be done. And I understand that the employees need to be safe be able to do their job safe, safely. And there are some precautions in place. You're never going to satisfy 100% of the people 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. They have been on a hybrid model from my understanding. Mm -hmm. And there are a few vendors that come in and clean and on different shifts or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking questions because I have gotten calls and I've gotten some emails from some folks that are threatening to retire. Some people have retired. Have retired, yeah. And filling those jobs is going to be hard. So I'm trying to be Switzerland. I'm trying to understand everything that's going on before I make any kind of judgment or start asking for things. I'm trying to hear the employees and their concerns. And I'm also trying to work with the directors to understand the big jobs that they have to do. Um, but I think January 31st, the executive said that people are coming back to work. And so I think there has also been an uptick of complaints because people don't want to go back. They don't want to go office. back into the office. Right, exactly. Just, you know, <laughs> that's like, no, that's it. It is what it is. You know, we're just doing thing on jobs. So, you know, people are not was, trying to. When I was back. working at the board of elections, we didn't get any downtime. Right. We right. had to go into the office every day. We right. had gloves, mm -hmm. we had masks, we had you know, the screenings upon entering mm -hmm. the office and we had Clorox, you know, we wipe our space off and then you buy your own stuff. Like there was no excuse. We had to come to work every day. Mm -hmm. so all these folks complaining about working from home, at least they got to work from home. Right. So I get it, you know, they want to continue to work from home. Any advice you got for the new executive? Well, one of the things that I'm getting good feedback on is that folks are happy that I am meeting with directors. I'm taking meetings with folks that some people have never met with. You mm -hmm. know, councilwoman is calling because she want to meet. What? Mm -hmm. She want to she wanna meet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it hasn't happened. So I would suggest that he really gets out there. He sees what, what inventory is there. He talked to his people and uh, just go on a listening tour within those folks that have been with the county for 15, 20 years before the government changed. You know, we, we got some lifers, mm -hmm. you know, we have some amazing staff on our county council. There's a lot of wealth and knowledge mm -hmm. there. When I was a member of the public, you mm -hmm. know, it just seemed very political. Now, how do you think that relates to your advice to him working with counsel? Well, we both have a job to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I would just suggest that he's got a big county. Yeah. It's, just, it's a big tent. Right. It's a big budget. He just got to do the right thing by the people. This is a hard job. You know, this is what I'm learning. People can criticize. But until you are in those shoes, you just don't know. You just don't know. You, you just don't know. So I've spoken with him, and I think he's doing the right thing. He's reaching out. Mm -hmm. And just because we're enemies today, that don't mean we're going to be enemies tomorrow. No permanent enemies, no permanent friends. So we have a common goal, which is the health and the wealth of the people in Cuyahoga County. So thank you for being on our show. Appreciate you taking the time. And I hope that this will be an opportunity for people to get a chance to know you better as you go in through the 
thing with counsel. I'm going to yeah. give you an opportunity to look right into this camera. I want you to tell people who you are, what you're running for, let them know how you can be accessible and all of that stuff. Hey, everybody, it's your girl, Meredith M. Turner. And I am the county council woman for District 9. Well, where is that? Are you my representative? If you live in Bedford, if you live in Bedford Heights, if you live in Cleveland, wards 1, 4, or 6, if you live in Highland Hills, if you live in Orange, Pepper Pike, North Randall, Shaker, Warrensville, or Woodmere, then I am your representative. I knew when I took on this task that I would be completing the last year of Chantel Brown's county council seat. So that's what the term I'm currently serving, but I'm on the ballot May 3rd for a new four year term. I'm a first time candidate, so I don't have any money y'all, but you can cash at me mm -hmm. at MM Turner 2022. That's my, my cash app. So you can help me get started. I'm on Instagram. This is Meredith Turner. Twitter, Facebook, look me up. If you live in my district, even if you don't live in my district, my goal is to make sure that everybody in the county has an opportunity to be healthy and wealthy. For many years, I've supported many candidates and I'm doing this because everybody kept saying, when can I support you? So now is that time you can support me by cash apping me at <laughs> MM Turner 2022 Would love to have you come volunteer. I'm looking to build my team. I have been an intricate member of a lot of people's teams over many years, more than half of my life. So if you're somebody that's new to this space and you want to get involved, I'll let your girl. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Once again, thanks, Meredith, for being on our show. If you'd like to leave any comments or any of that stuff, you can leave that in the comments section, as well as we're going to leave links with descriptions in our description panel, where you can reach out to Meredith and get more information to her about her campaign and how you can get involved. So look at that in our description panel at the bottom of your screen. Thanks again. See you next time. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow.